all and welcome to Calvary Chapel of the Palm Beaches. Whether this is your first time here or whether you're watching us online, again, we are glad that you are here. Now, what's happening here today is this. We are continuously working our way through the book of Luke. Right now, we are in Luke chapter 3. One of the things that we do here at Calvary Chapel that's unique to most churches is we don't teach from the Bible. We teach the Bible. We go line upon line, precept on top of precept through the entire Bible. And the reason why we do that is because we found out, we know that's the best way for us to grow. See, because as human beings, man, we can go off on a little tangent. As human beings, you know, we can go into the Bible and, oh, oh, I like this. And so I'm going to read this and I'm going to read this over and over again. And I like this and I'm going to read this over and over again. But this part right here, I don't like that. So I'm going to skip that. But what that causes is this. It causes us to be unbalanced. It causes us to be unbalanced as human beings. Man, we know that, man. I love to go to the restaurant and eat some ribs. And then to have some apple pie. In fact, let's kill it. Let's put some ice cream on top of that too. But we know if we continue to eat like that day in and day out, we're going to be unhealthy. Amen? And so there's a time where we have to switch up our diet. We have to have a balanced diet. And so by going through the word systematically, that gives us a balanced diet. It keeps us hmm, on the straight and the narrow path. In fact, the Lord, in fact, the Bible teaches us that that is the best way for us to go through the scriptures. Listen to this scripture. You find this in the book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 1, it talks about eating the whole roll of the word of God. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 27, it talks about the whole counsel of God. And so we go systematically through the word of God so that we can get the whole counsel of God. So that way we can remain and become balanced. Now. I officially begin our time today by quoting to you from the book of John, John chapter 20. In John chapter 20, verse 31, it says this, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so what we're going to see in today's study is we're going to see some things that are written so that we may believe. And so with all this in mind, let's go ahead and begin reading. We pick up our study again in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 3, starting right there in verse 1. And it reads, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Inherit, inherit rather, Tetriac of Galilee, and his brother Philip, Tetriac of Aronium, and Tancrenus, and Licinius, rather, and Tetriac of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and, Annas and Caiaphas, the, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Stop right there, if you will. Even though I messed up them names, I often wonder, you know, why are those names even in there? I believe the Lord puts them in there to keep pastors humbled. But those names that are there are there for a reason. See, the first thing that we need to know, and I want you to understand, is this. And that is that What we're looking at here in Luke chapter 3 has taken place 18 years after what we looked at in Luke chapter 2. Some of you might recall how that in Luke chapter 2, the earthly parents of Jesus took Jesus, who was 12 years old, up to the feast in Jerusalem. And they forgot him. They left him. They got halfway home, and they looked around saying, where's Jesus? Anybody seen Jesus? 
So they forgot their son. They forgot the son of God. And so what that says to me and you is this. When we forget to pick up our child from daycare, when you get halfway home and you go, oh, snap, I forgot to pick up my son from daycare. Oh, snap, I left my son at the babysitter. Wow. We had a brother in the church one time, got home and his wife called him and said, did you forget something? He forgot his wife, left her, went home. Yes. And so again, what this tells us is we all forget something. And so don't beat yourself up so bad if you forget again to pick up your child or to pick up your family member or whatever. But again, in this period of time, 18 years has passed. And that's important because many times we look in the Bible, many times we read in the Bible, and we think that all of these things were happening every single day. You can go from one verse to the next verse and years have taken place. So 18 years, 18 years have passed between what we saw in Luke chapter 2 to what we're looking at here now. And the second thing that I want you to see is this. And that is that John the Baptist's ministry began in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, when Herod was tetriot of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetriot of Iteronian and Tychonus, and Licinius was tetriot in Abilene, and when Annas and Caiaphas were both high priests. Now, for most people, including most of us who are sitting here, that means absolutely nothing. That's just a bunch of names of some people that you do not know and some places that you do not know. So in actuality, you really don't care about that. But the reason why those things are written is so that we can believe, so that we can know that Jesus is the Christ. So you have a lot of people who think you have a lot of people who feel, you have a lot of people who believe that the Bible is nothing but a bunch of made-up stories. They think that it's just stories that people put together. Stories like, oh, the two fairy, or Cinderella, or Santa Claus. Now, you do know those things are not real, right? But some people think that the Bible is the same way. It's just made up of a bunch of stories. But I've told you this before, and I tell you this again, that the Christian faith is a faith that's based upon facts. It's a faith that's based upon facts. So these names, these people were written down so that we can trace them out. So we can go and look and say, hey, did these people really live? Did these people really exist? Were these towns and uh, areas really there? And when you look them up, you find out they were. You can go home and you can Google and you will see that these people really, really existed. And what that does is this. It helps to solidify your faith. It helps you to realize that what you're standing on is solid. And so what God has written here is not just, you know, just some names, but it's there for a reason. And so what you have here is this. You have the Lord our God doing a work so that all can see. See, so understand something. What the Lord has done, what the Lord is doing, and what the Lord is going to do is not done in a vacuum. But it's done so that everybody can see. Always remember the scripture where it says that it is God's will that none would perish, but that all would come into repentance. And so God puts things in place because people are sometimes skeptical. Especially when you look at something that's so good, it's like, man, that, that can't be real. You know, or something that challenges you and you don't want it to be real. 
So God puts things in place so that we can go and we can check it out and say, wow. As young people would say, facts. Facts. That's facts. And so what the Lord is doing here, he's not doing it in the vacuum. He's doing it so everybody can see. Third thing I want you to see and understand about this past scripture is this. Now that is regardless to how dark and evil and wicked the world becomes, God is still God and he still does great and marvelous things. Are you hearing me? Regardless to how dark or evil or wicked the world becomes, God, because he is God, he does marvelous and great things. And so when you look at this, what you see is this. You see that when John the Baptist came on the scene, a guy by the name of Tiberius Caesar was in place. Tiberius Caesar was an emperor. And he was known for his cruelty. He was known for his severity. Then you had Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was also known for his cruelty. He was just known for slaughtering the Jewish people. Pontius Pilate was also the one who gave the final order for the crucifixion of Christ. You also had Herod and Philip and Licinius. They were cruel and corrupt. And then you had uh, Caiaphas and also Annas who were both high priests. Now understand this. Both of them were high priests at the same time when the scriptures, when the law says there was only to be one high priest at a time. The high priest was born. He went into the office and he stayed into the office until he died. Then you got another high priest. But yet here you had two high priests Right? And both of these high priests played a major part in having Jesus put to death. And so what I want you to see, what I want you to understand is this, that when John came on the scene, the political and the religious world were corrupt. Both of them were out of order. But again, God, because he is God and he's rich in mercy. And he's full of love and kindness. He said, I'm going to send a savior. I'm going to send a deliverer. And so what this tells us is this, and I pray that this encourages your heart. What this tells us is regardless of how dark and evil things might get around us, God is still moving. See, right now, again, you can look at the, the political situation in Washington. And man, we can get so disrupt by what we see and just go, you know what, Psh, I'm done. I'm done. I was thinking about running for office. Not only am I not going to run for office, I ain't even voting. I'm done. That's just a total mess. But at the same time, sometimes we can look at a, a priest or we can look at a pastor and see the things that they say and see the things that they do and the same thing we go, you know what, out. I'm out. I don't want to have anything to do with this. And the enemy loves to discourage us in that. And so what the Lord is showing, what the Spirit is showing is that regardless of how deep or how ugly or how wicked things become, God is still sitting on the throne and God is still doing the work. So do not let, do not let what you see in Washington, do not let what you see some priests or some pastors do stop you from doing what's right. To stop you from doing what God has called for you to do. See, because the devil loves, the devil loves to discourage us. The devil loves to just beat us up, holding us back from doing what's right and just break our hearts. I don't know about you, but man, there was a time in my life that again, I got so discouraged with what I saw in the church. I said, I would never set foot in another church as long as I live. See, because I'm one of those people that either I'm in or I'm out. 
There's no in between. When I was in the world, when I was in the street, when I was a sinner, I wasn't a regular sinner. I was a four-star general. I was doing it to death. Doing it to death. But when God says it's time for a change, I knew immediately that certain things and certain people had to move away. But I came into the church and some of the things that I thought I was leaving out in the world was right there in the church. And I got disgusted. And the enemy loves, he loves to discourage us from standing up and doing what's right. We go through the scriptures. We see that happening over and over and over again. Some of you know the prophet Elijah. The prophet Elijah was this mighty man of God. But he got so discouraged one time that he said, you know what? I'm the only one left. Lord, I'm the only one who is zealous for you. To which the Lord said, and you find this in the book of 1 Kings. The first Kings chapter 19 and verse 18, the Lord says, not so. I have reserved 7,000 others who have not bowed the knee or kissed ball, which was a false God. Even the apostle Paul, right? The apostle Paul again just got so discouraged that the Lord had to speak to his heart. And this is what the Lord said to Paul, right? In Acts chapter 18. In verses 9 and 10, the Lord says, do not be afraid. And I always understand something. When the Lord says, do not be afraid, that means they're afraid. Right? So the Lord says, do not be afraid, but to keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack or harm you, because I have many people in this city. Again, the Lord, I mean, the devil loves to make us feel that we're standing all alone. Because if we're standing all alone or we feel like we're standing all alone, many times we won't stand. And so, again, regardless of how dark it might get in Washington, D.C., regardless of how much corruption we might see, regardless of what we might see in the church house, some, what some pastor does, what some priest does, do not let that stop you from doing what God has called for you to do. In fact, everything that you look at and say in the political system or in the religious system that's wrong, if God is calling you to that, you should say, I would never be that. I would never do that. But you be encouraged. You're being encouraged. And so John, who's the forerunner of Jesus, he came on the set preaching a message, a powerful message that God had placed in his heart. And what was that message? Look, if you will, again, at the latter part of verse 2. In the latter part of verse 2, it says, the word of God came to John son of Zechariah in the wilderness. And he went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley to be filled in. Every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight. The rough ways smooth. And all the people will see God's salvation. So here you have John. in the son of Zechariah. He's out in the wilderness. And God speaks to his heart. Now understand something. This is not when John received his calling. John received his calling and John received his ministry from the Lord many, many years before. Some of you might recall how that in, in Luke chapter 1, 
how that the angel Gabriel went to John's father, Zachariah, and said, John, I said, Zachariah, brother, the Lord has called your son to be the forerunner of the Messiah, right? What we're looking at there in, uh, in Luke chapter 1, when uh, the commission came down, it said what we're looking at here, when John coming out of the wilderness, 30 years, 30 years have gone by. As I said before, sometimes again from one scripture to the next scripture, when you look at the Bible, when you read the Old Testament, and then you begin the New Testament, 400 years has passed. And so now it's been 30 years since the angel spoke to John's father. And now John is about to walk into that which the Lord had called him to do. Again, between chapter 1 and chapter 3, there's 30 years. And here's the thing. If the Lord says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. If the Lord says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. The thing is, we have to wait for it. See, a lot of people miss out on what the Lord has promised and what the Lord is doing because we do not wait. And the thing we must understand is this, waiting on the Lord does not mean to wait passively, but it means to wait actively. There's a difference. Again, waiting on the Lord does not mean that we sit back and do nothing. It means that we wait actively. For example, if the Lord says he's going to bring forth a harvest, my job, your job, our job is to prepare the field. Amen? If the Lord says that he's going to bring forth a harvest, if we believe that he's going to bring forth the harvest, our job is to prepare the field. Our job is to go out there and get up all of the rocks and get all of the debris up. Our job is to break up that fallow ground. That's faith in action. And so again, many times again, people don't receive from the Lord because again, they don't wait upon the Lord. And again, waiting upon the, waiting upon the Lord is not something that we do passively, but we do actively. Listen to this scripture. Many of you know this scripture. It comes from the book of James. It says, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Let him do not think that he's going to receive anything from the Lord. And here's why. It's not that the Lord is going to hold anything back. It's because they're unstable that they won't receive anything from the Lord. Imagine, if you will, you go into a nursery, not a daycare, but a nursery where they have plants and all the rest of that, right? And you get this fruit tree. Right? And they guarantee you, man, you plant this fruit tree here, man, you're going to get all kind of fruit. Or maybe you have a friend, or maybe you have a neighbor, and you see, man, all of these fruit trees in their yard, and you see them blessed, and they give you a tree and say, go home and plant this, man, and watch what happens. And you take that fruit tree, and you go ahead, and you plant it, and you put it in the ground. But two weeks later, you dig it up, and you put it over someplace else. And two weeks later, you dig it up. And you put it someplace else. Two weeks later, you dig it up and you put it someplace else. That tree will never, ever, ever bear fruit. Imagine, if you will, the Lord says, go. Plant the field. And you say, Lord, what kind of crop would you have me to plant? And the Lord says, whatever makes you happy. Whatever you plant. I'm going to grow. I'm going to blossom it. And you say, yes, Lord. And you go out there and you say, you know what? Right now, looking at the stock market, man, potatoes are in high demand. And you go out here and you plant all these potatoes. But then two months later, you look up and you go, man, I see tomatoes. It's now rising up. And you dig up all of your potatoes and you plant 
tomatoes. But then later on, you look up and you go, wow, cucumbers. That's where it's at. And you go dig up all of your tomatoes and you plant cucumbers. And you keep doing that. What are you going to receive? Nothing. And it's because you are unstable. It's because you're unstable. And so Zechariah told his son John what the angel Gabriel had said. And Zechariah taught his, taught his son to walk in the ways of the Lord. And because the Lord had a special anointing upon John, he was told never to drink any fermented drink. And so at the age of 20, the Lord called John out into the wilderness. See, John was in the priestly line of Levi. And at the age of 20, he would have officially began his uh, studies, his ministerial studies. But instead of him going into the ministerial studies of the priesthood, because God called him above being a priest to being a prophet, the Lord says, come out here into the wilderness. Spend some time with me. And so after being out in the wilderness for 10 years, and we know he was there for 10 years because, again, in the priesthood, the guy would officially start his studies at 20 and would officially walk into the office at 30. So at 30 years old, John comes out of the wilderness, and he's preaching a message. He's preaching a message. That came straight from the heart of God. And what was that message? Repent. Repent. Prepare ye the way for the Lord. See, because that's the way that we receive the Lord. If we are going to receive the Lord, it first starts with repentance. See, without repentance, there could be no forgiveness. And without forgiveness, there can be no salvation. Are you hearing me? If you're listening, say amen. amen. Without repentance, there can be no forgiveness. And without forgiveness, there can be no salvation. Now understand, salvation is holy and totally of the Lord. From the utmost to the gutmost, Jesus saves. It's not that Jesus partially saves and then we got to partially do the rest. No, salvation is holy and totally of the Lord. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 2, in verses 8 and 9, it says, By grace have you been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God and not of works, though any should boast. So salvation is holy and totally of the Lord. But the fact still remains that salvation is always preceded by repentance. And what is repentance? Repentance is a turning away from that which the Lord God says is wrong. Repentance is a turning away from that which God says is sin. But see, the problem is this. The problem is most people like their sins. In fact, the Bible actually says that sin is pleasurable for a season. People like their sins. People get comfortable in their sins. And what's so bad right now in our world is a lot of people are living in sin. A lot of people are walking in sin and don't even realize it because our world is teaching that right is wrong and wrong is right. And so you have a lot of people who are totally messed up and they don't even understand sin. And so here you have John. John comes on the scene. Proclaiming a message of 
repentance. Now again, remember, everything is messed up. The political system is full of corruption. The priesthood is full of corruption. Everywhere you look, it's inundated with sin and wickedness and ugliness. But in the midst of all of that, John comes on the scene preaching a message that God had laid upon his heart. And what God is doing is he's calling. He's calling the people back to himself. We sung in this song, his love is running after us. He's chasing after us. And so what he's doing is he's chasing after the people. He's not looking at the people going, look at the emperor, look at the governor, look at this person, look at this. They don't deserve my goodness. They don't deserve my kindness. They don't deserve my grace. I'm done. He doesn't look at the church. He doesn't look at the priesthood and say, they're messed up and this messed up and they're messed up. Call me when y'all get it right. His love. His love. is running after them. As I said earlier, I don't know about you, but I can look back over my life and I can see where the love of the Lord was running after me. I told you a couple of weeks ago how that the first time I received a calling of coming to be a fisher of man, I'm sitting at my house watching TV, smoking a joint. And the king of kings come on. And there was the Lord called and said, come and follow me. And I'll make you fishers of men. And man, I began to just bawl. And I began to cry. And I look back over my life again. I see the places where I were, the things that I was doing. It was just so ugly. So ugly. This one was going to prison. And that one was going to prison. And this one was dying. And that one was dying. And the Lord was just watching over me in the middle of the darkness. His love was running after. And so when I looked up and I saw John, John's preaching this message of repentance. It's not a, a heavy message. It's not a message of, you know, you better or not. It's a message of tears. Kind of like when we go to the book of Genesis, right after man sin, and the Lord says, Adam, Adam, where are you? Some people hear the Lord saying that in an angry voice. Adam, Adam, where are you, Adam? No. If you know anything about my Lord, if you didn't think about my God, he was weeping. Adam, Adam, where are you, Adam? And he knew where Adam was. But Adam had to come out on his own. God out of his love, God out of his compassion, was an Adam, even though you sin. Even though you blew it, even though you have set some things into operation where millions and millions and millions of people are going to suffer, Adam, I still desire you. So if you're sitting here today and you're feeling like, man, God don't want to talk to me. God doesn't want to have anything to do with me. In fact, I thought when I walked in the door, the roof was going to cave in. Not so. God says, I desire you. I desire you. And so again, John comes on the scene preaching this message of repentance because it was the Lord calling the people back to himself. John says, prepare you the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Make the crooked straight and the rough places smooth. And so question, question. 
What has the Lord been speaking to you about in your life? What changes has the Lord said to you that you need to make? Where has the Lord spoken to you and say, you need to make correction? See, now is the acceptable time of the Lord. The day is the day of salvation. So the heart of the Lord is calling. And so once again, as we started, we end. These things were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. And in believing, you can have life in his name. Amen. Let me give you some lessons to go home with and we're done. Lesson number one. Regardless of how dark and evil the world may become, that does not stop the Lord our God from doing great and mighty things. Don't get caught up in the darkness. Look, don't let the darkness deter you. It still does not stop God from doing great things. Number two, the devil loves to try and make us feel that we are all alone when we stand for truth and righteousness. But the devil is a liar. The Lord always got a ram in the bush. You're never alone. Number three, if the Lord our God said that he's going to do something, it shall surely come to pass. Wait on it. Wait on it. Number four, waiting on the Lord does not mean to wait. It means to wait really actively, not passively. Waiting on the Lord means to wait actively and not passively. And number five, without repentance, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And without forgiveness of sin, there can be no salvation. And this week's challenge is this, to step up and to step out on that which the Lord God has spoken to you. We're gonna ask prayer partners, they will to come forward If you're here today and you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, now is the time to do so. Or maybe you have received Jesus, but man, you got caught up in the things of the world. You got caught up in the things of this life, but you're ready to come back home. You're ready to make it right with the Lord. Come up and pray. Maybe you're troubled again about your son or trouble about your daughter or whatever. There's people up here to pray for you. You're never alone. Thank you guys for uh, coming out today. Thank you guys for tuning in online. Please continue to pray for us. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father in heaven again, we thank you that you love us and that you love runs hard after us, oh God. Even in the deepest darkness of evil, you still pursue us, Lord. Mm. As your word says, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his love toward us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Lord, again, that when we are at our lowest low, Lord, again, your arms are outstretched to us. Mm. Look on the homes. Look on the families. Look on the people this day, oh God. Mm. Draw us all closer to you. So again, that we can be the light, that we can be the salt. 
that we can enjoy the blessings and be blessings to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.